Good morning. My name is Erin Cito, and I'm the Public Policy Associate for Wildlands Network. Wildlands Network has partnered with ARC Solutions, the Center for Large Landscape Conservation, and the National Parks Conservation Association to create this webinar series dedicated to de demystifying wildlife crossing infrastructure projects. Thank you for joining us for the first webinar in the series. Our second webinar on the fundamental role of good data in successful wildlife crossing projects is scheduled for Wednesday, May 11th at 1 p.m. Mountain Time. And the final date for the third webinar on funding opportunities is forthcoming. The registration link for the second webinar will be in the chat box momentarily and an invitation to register will be sent to all who registered for this first webinar. For this first webinar, entitled Wildlife Vehicle Collisions, Why Should You Care? We're joined by our expert panelists who all have diverse and valuable experience studying and implementing wildlife crossing infrastructure. Patty Garvey Darda, wildlife biologist with the US Forest Service will first kick us off today with a presentation on how roadway fragmentation and wildlife vehicle collisions affect the wildlife within the forest she manages around I-90 in the state of Washington. Then Rob Amon with the Western Transportation Institute will follow Patty discussing wildlife infrastructure solutions and the benefits associated with implementing properly sited crossings. Finally, we'll be joined by Scott Jackson, Extension Professor in the Department of Environmental Conservation at the University of Massachusetts Amherst to discuss the importance of aquatic connectivity and the infrastructure options that can help improve aquatic con connectivity. At the conclusion of their presentations, Anna Wern, the Director of Government Affairs for the Center for Large Landscape Conservation, will be moderating our questions and answers portion of the webinar. Audience members will have roughly 15 to 20 minutes at the end to have their submitted questions answered by our panelists through Zoom's Q&A platform, as well as upvote any submitted questions that they read that they would also like to have answered. Please feel free to submit any questions that you may have for panelists as we go along. To our audience members, we thank you again for being here to learn about this super important issue. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Patty. Okay, so I'm a novice on all this, so I'll, okay, so I share my screen, share, and then the bottom right is full screen. Are you there, Patty? Sorry, folks, for the technical difficulties. Seems that Patty may have lost her connection. We'll give her just another second to log back in here. All right, well, we're waiting for Patty to skip back, uh, to get back in here, but why don't we just for the sake of time, um, if you don't mind, Scott, would you be able to jump in with your presentation? Sure, no problem. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for attending this uh, 
this wonderful program. I'm looking forward to listening to the other two speakers. Uh, I'm going to speak relatively briefly about uh, aquatic connectivity, why it's important, and what are some of the approaches that are being used to try to address it. So it's important you know, for us to know, but also to communicate to others, the importance of movement for wildlife populations, including fish populations and vertebrate populations. That movement is important for seeking out uh, food, shelter, to escape unfavorable conditions, to, uh, for, uh, for mating, and, and for accessing vital habitats. Uh, but river and stream ecosystems are long linear ecosystems that are vulnerable to fragmentation because there's limited opportunities to avoid unfavorable conditions in, in the vertical dimension, moving up and down in the water column. And it's somewhat limited moving from bank to bank. And so the most critical dimension for or movement over the, the span of time necessary to maintain populations is upstream and downstream movement. Uh, downstream movements are sometimes easy when you have storm systems, you sometimes get involuntary movement of animals downstream, and then they have to work their way back upstream. And the upstream movement is much more difficult, especially as human infrastructure interferes with um, the ability to move upstream. We've known for many years that dams are important impediments to upstream movement for aquatic organisms. It's only relatively recently, you know, in the last 30 years or so that we have focused on the role of road stream crossings and in particular on culverts in blocking the movement of aquatic organisms. And some have referred to culverts as dams with a hole in them. Some of the problems that we find with culverted crossings is that they constrict the flow of water so that at higher flows you get excessive velocities uh, that may be either too fast for organisms to swim against or the distances that they have to swim means that they get exhausted before they reach the other end of the pipe. You can have inlet drops that develop over time as you constrict the flow and back up water. Uh, some of the debris that's suspended in the water is then deposited at the inlet and can create an inlet drop so that as organisms are fighting against that flow, uh, when they get to the other end of the culvert, they have to leap in order to get out. At the other end where you have that excessive velocity, you have scour that sometimes occurs and creates large scour pools, or uh, there may be instability in the downstream portion of the channel, and that creates outlet drops where it, it's impossible to get through the culvert without leaping to get into it first. And some of these outlet drops can be quite quite large. Uh, engineers and, and highway department officials often anticipate this scour and will use armoring to try to protect the structure uh, against being uh, undermined by that scour. And so you get uh, situations where this armoring may be good for the structure, but not so good for the organisms that need to use it. In the lower left is a twin box culvert crossing where they use blacktop to armor the, the stream channel for about 30 feet. And then you see that the outlet drop formed anyway, but it's at the end of the armoring rather than at the end of the structure. In the upper right is a structure that looks not so bad, except that all of that riffly uh, water that you see is actually flowing over rocks embedded in concrete. And so in this case, they actually concreted the river channel for about 150 feet below the outlet. And even though you may have athletic fish like trout that can move up uh, high gradient systems, they can't do it in the absence of resting pools. Sometimes when these structures fail, they're replaced by larger structures, which is generally not a bad idea, except that if you spread the water flow out at low, low flow conditions, you can sometimes create uh, water depths that are insufficient for aquatic organisms to pass through. So when we think about how to make these things more passable, often the focus is on migratory species of fish or uh, fish that are relatively athletic, like salmonids. But there's a whole ecosystem of organisms that have to move through these systems. And they include, you know, smaller fish like dace, weaker swimming fish like darters, uh, aquatic phases of salamanders, uh, as well as invertebrates and, and uh, juvenile fish. And so when we look at a typical stream and we wonder how do these small weak swimming species exist in these channels and how do they move against the current, it's important to recognize that there's actually a diversity of pathways that they can take. 
So a large body fish might take uh, the channel, the deepest part of the channel and move right up through the thalwag. But there are alternative ways that you can go, and these may shift and change as flow dynamics change in these streams. And so some species can move through uh, high velocity water as long as they have a resting pool at the other end. And so a diversity of flow paths, a diversity of, uh, di of velocities is really critical. And for the smallest, weakest swimming fish in particular, they tend to hug the bank. And so the bank edge of the stream is an important area of low velocity water where the drag that you get from the bottom and from the bank uh, help maintain lower velocity flows. So you compare and contrast a natural stream like this with a typical culvert situation. You don't have the diversity of flows. You don't have the diversity of pathways. You don't have any resting pools. And so these create significant barriers to the movement of, of a whole host of aquatic species. And beyond just aquatic species, we also care about a variety of riverine semi-aquatic species that typically move upstream and downstream along the channel. And these can include variety of turtles or stream salamanders, as well as uh, mammals such as otters, mink, beaver, muskrat, and things like star-nosed moles. Uh, Star-nosed moles are an animal that I've always pondered. Moles in general, how do they get across roads and highways? Because clearly they're not gonna make it by crawling over the tarmac. At least the star-nosed mole as a semi-aquatic mammal can swim un uh, underneath the road if it has a suitable cover. And among these, turtles are a particular sensitivity to roadkill. And so this is the only animal vehicle collision photograph that I have in my presentation. And it really happens when relatively aquatic turtles or semi-aquatic turtles like snapping turtles and, and the blandings turtle in the lower right are moving up and downstream and find the culverts unsuitable and choose to go over the road surface instead. And, and with terrestrial wildlife, we know that openness is an important factor for whether wildlife will choose to use an underpass system. We suspect that this may also be the case for things like turtles and in some cases for fish. A lot of these culverts occur on smaller streams up in the headwaters, and yet uh, these streams are extremely important within watersheds because they make up a large percentage of the stream miles in any given watershed. They cumulatively provide more habitat and more diverse habitat than large rivers. They support species that are not found in those larger systems. They tend to be areas of high productivity and thereby provide important spawning and nursery habitat for fish. I'm using a relatively rural watershed in Massachusetts to illustrate just how big of a problem it is when you consider these road stream crossings. In Massachusetts, we have the legacy of small scale industrialization and we have dams all over the place. So this is the distribution of dams in that watershed and surrounding area. These are the roads and railroad networks. And this, these are all the road crossings and railroad crossings that when you add to the dams, can represent a highly fragmented ecosystem, yet we still have time to try to repair the damage and reconnect these aquatic systems. So in some states, they've developed stream crossing standards to try to encourage people to put in more uh, suitable crossings for aquatic organism passage. Uh, in the Northeast, in the New England area, the Army Corps of Engineers has incorporated these standards into the general permits for those states. And so there are regulatory ways of trying to improve the situation. But there are many, many road crossings out there and a lot of culverts. And so it's important to be able to set priorities. Uh, in the 13 Northeastern states, ranging from Virginia and West Virginia up through New England, uh, there's an organization called the, the North Atlantic Aquatic Connectivity Collaborative that was formed to create a, a network of people to develop unified uh, stream crossing assessment protocols and an infrastructure for supporting uh, local uh, surveys and assessment programs so that people can use our protocols. So this is our aquatic protocol. We also have a terrestrial uh, assessment protocol for the passage for terrestrial wildlife. And then these are put into a database and as part of our NAACC data center, those data are then scored. So it provides every crossing an aquatic passability score. 
These are then used in landscape-based models like that of the, uh, the Nature Conservancy's Northeast Aquatic Connectivity Project in order to help prioritize uh, dams and road stream crossings for removal or replacement at, in, in such a way that we can uh, target our resources at those areas that will do the most good. From those assessments, we can then develop online decision support tools that can uh, provide a lot of uh, adapt, uh, allow people to customize the analysis themselves and identify the things that are most important and filter the data to identify the road stream crossings of, of greatest importance to them. And then ultimately what we are doing this for is to encourage and to facilitate the replacement of substandard culverts like the one on the left with open bottom structures like the one on the right that uh, utilize a stream simulation design approach. And for people that are interested in stream simulation and learning more about it, the, the Forest Service has an incredible uh, manual on stream simulation that's available that provides a lot of detailed information about the ecological reasons for doing it, as well as the technical uh, ways of getting it done. And I'll just wrap up by showing you some of the URLs for the work that we're doing in the Northeast on this. There are many people involved and so we've created a stream continuity portal website that has uh, links to different uh, collaborative organizations, including the Southeast Aquatic Resources Partnership, um, as well as a variety of online tools that are available uh, for uh, assessing or accessing data. This is uh, the NAACC website, which is just a part of that stream continuity portal. And I appreciate being invited to speak with you today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Okay, I may need your help again. For some reason, this is not working great. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes, just click on display settings in the top left. Okay. And switch to swap presenter view and slide view. There you go. Okay, I apologize, everybody. I don't know why my computer decided to randomly say I had a problem and I needed to that needed to log me off. So anyway, um, so uh, basically I was just gonna talk about um, highways in general and then use uh, I-90 as an example. Um, and so obviously roads are integral to everything we do, um, but they disrupt ecosystems, they fragment habitats, they create barriers to movement, they disrupt, disrupt the natural hydrology, they create fish and aquatic organism passage barriers. They serve as a conduit for the introduction of invasive species and they cause wildlife vehicle collisions. And why should we care about that? Uh, well, because it's a risk to human safety, direct mortality to wildlife. We get loss of individuals um, and uh, you know, fragment everything. So I'm gonna go a little faster since I'm, I'm a little behind now, I think. Um, so I was just gonna discuss um, I-90 as an example, there's all these very negative things about the roads that have developed over the last 70 years, uh, but there is also uh, optimism out there because there's lots of tools and that's what Scott was talking about, Rob will talk about too. I-90 is another example um, that is, uh, it gives me a lot of hope and uh, it's really, uh, um, I wanna give kudos to Washington Department of Transportation, South Central Region. They're, uh, they're just really amazing. Um, they basically have been so talented, so good at collaboration. They're kind and they're innovative. And so I'm just really lucky uh, to get to work with them. Uh, so this is the project area. It basically, uh, this is uh, Washington, obviously, and this is I-90 going across. This is where project area is. We're really lucky because we have lots of 
uh, protected lands, whether, whether it's national forest, national parks, or tribal lands. So we have connectivity all the way from, of the Cascades on either side, all the way from the Oregon border up to the Canadian border. Um, however, I-90 has become a barrier, and then the Columbia River down here, the border with Oregon is a natural barrier. This is what the highway looked like in 1920. And this is, so it's two lanes and then we went to four lanes and now we are moving to six lanes. And as you can see with that, like a flying squirrel could have flown across. We have these lichen that have to disperse through canopies. And it, so it's disrupting all of that. Um, this is a, a picture of the roadkill incidents on I-90. The truth is it's not as high as a lot of places and that's because the traffic volumes are up to about 40,000 vehicles per day, more than that on a, a busy day. And um, animals have sort of stopped trying in some ways. Um, and the risk to the public as far as accidents is a big deal, but it also has consequences on interstate commerce. With I-90 now, these are 10-year-old statistics, but they would say when the highway closed for 24 hours. Uh, that was a loss of 21 million in interstate commerce. And we do have these road kills closing the highway, uh, partly because elk travel in herds. And a lot of times it's not just one animal that was hit or one person hits a, a deer and then there's everybody else hits everybody else. So anyway, it does have serious consequences on interstate commerce besides the cost of uh, people being injured and or killed and then property damage as well. And everyone, usually when we talk about connectivity, they're pretty focused on the larger animals because they have large home ranges and they are at risk um, of uh, extirpation because they need large home ranges. So they need lots of space to roam. And even though the South Cascades being isolated from the North Cascades seems like it wouldn't be an issue, but for uh, animals with a large home ranges like Wolverine, uh, there just isn't enough land there to have a viable population. So being able to get across I-90 is critical. Um, it's also a big deal for the whole ecosystem, every species out there, mollusks, amphibians, um, reptiles, small mammals, um, we have 10 species of terrestrial mollusks, so those don't uh, go by stream channels, so they have no way to get across. They disperse very slowly, so we really need crossing structures that they can live in uh, for generations, and that's how we get connectivity for species like that. A lot of insects and soil organisms as well. Um, uh, we've done a lot of monitoring on I-90, and we have been able to show that um, mountain goat, elk, um, uh, western toads, and pika have been genetically isolated by I-90, um, but that is getting fixed. Uh, there's also lots of problems with highways because of uh, the, it creates fish passage barriers as well as uh, impacts to the hydrologic connectivity. Uh, so uh, now I can talk about the optimistic stuff. On I-90, that 15 miles, DOT is putting in all kinds of structures to try to recreate um, whole ecosystems. So we're putting in, where we can, we're putting in very large structures like overcrossings, but also a lot of undercrossings. And we are uh, adding native soil or basically mulch and compost. Um, and then native plants, uh, DOT pays for us to collect uh, local native seed. We grow it up in a nursery for five years. And then those are the plants that are planted. And the plant success is very successful. But we're also experimenting with things like inoculating the soil so that we can try to get the soils going because we have a lot of rare fungus we want that are important to the ecosystems on either side. These are some examples of the undercrossings. Uh, and these ones that are pictured were just planted um, two years ago. So we're still, uh, the plants are still coming up. We also put in lots of in-stream wood, lots of terrestrial wood, um, rock piles, and we try to completely mimic the habitat north and south of um, 
I-90 so that it's seamless for the animals as they're coming through. This is just more examples. Uh, this is another example. This was a 1,100-foot um, bridge that was um, across the floodplain. Um, and there's bull trout in here and it's critical habitat. This is a Forest Service road that was the old I-90. And in the infrastructure bill, I'm hoping I can get money where we have the designs of the NEPA done for an 800 foot bridge over this, over the stream, over the floodplain, and then a separate 120 foot bridge to match the 120 foot bridge here. There's another picture of the same. Uh, and sometimes we can't get the heights. We have standards for wildlife and large structures. Uh, we build them so that it has to be uh, a minimum. The large structures have to be a, a minimum of 100 feet wide, but a lot of them are, are a lot bigger. One of them that'll be going in before too long is 600 feet wide. Um, and there are two 300 foot wide structures that are going in. Um, uh, the construction starts this year. Um, but when we can't get that height requirement, we always want 12 feet above the average snow load. Um, and then, but there's a lot of places where that doesn't work. Um, we just don't, the construct, constructability isn't there. So we'll do fish passage. All these, I-90 was all fish passage barriers, lots of streams, everything a fish passage barrier for some life history stage. Um, and this is what we do when we can't, you know, do the whole ecosystem story. Um, we also have, there's lots of overland flow areas, wetlands, and traditionally what would happen is all of these hydrologic features would just be, would go into a ditch and then, you know, all channeled into one culvert and then spread out on the other side. And that really isn't uh, the way we want things to naturally function as far as recharging aquifers and having good habitat for connectivity. So DOT has put in a lot of these innovative structures where we'll put in 26 culverts in a row um, to try to spread out water. Um, one of the new innovations they're trying uh, in this next construction contract is actually to put in permeable fill in those areas, um, we could call them hydrologic connectivity zones so that the water can spread out naturally. And that's all I had. So hopefully I didn't talk too long. Uh, thank you. I guess I'm up next, uh, and I'll be uh, discussing uh, a, a series of over 20 different mitigation measure, measures, their effectiveness, and their impact on reducing the barrier effect of roads. Um, I need to get into presentation mode. Just a moment. Um, I'm Rob Amon. I'm the Road Ecology Program Manager at the Western Transportation Institute. And so I'll first provide an overview, then uh, look at some of the effective measures, uh, some that aren't, uh, as well as which provide uh, ecological connectivity. And then I'll do just a short update on cost benefit analysis uh, that uh, the, a project uh, uh, we're working on. Uh, these numbers have been used for over 10 years. And the good thing about uh, the current bill that passed the recent infrastructure bill is that they're going to update this national study. So uh, you, we keep seeing these numbers over and over again for the last 15 years. And we're really pleased to see that uh, there will be an update uh, scheduled as part of the bill. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that um, the problem is often underestimated. Uh, and we keep seeing uh, different studies that show that actual versus uh, or what's in uh, traditional data collection systems and what's really occurring uh, is quite often uh, underestimated by quite large amounts. Uh, and so keep that in mind too, as we look at um, cost benefits later. And so uh, I'll first uh, go through some of the effectiveness of 
of the existing measures. Uh, we were asked to do this uh, as part of a pooled fund study. You can see all the sponsors. Uh, and it was about wildlife vehicle collision reductions and habitat connectivity. So totally appropriate for today's discussion. And uh, we're in process. Uh, the WTI team uh, was selected to do the research task or the task one team. And we have eight research projects. And the first thing we were to do was to review uh, existing mitigation measures and their effectiveness. So um, when you look at those measures, uh, 15 are designed to influence driver behavior, a dozen to influence animal, be animal behavior or its population size, and then three that separate animals from the road. Uh, the project was just finished in the uh, winter of last year, so it's now available online. The link is below. We'll try to get that in the chat. Uh, and when you think about influencing driver behavior, we know how difficult it is. Uh, drunken driving has been on for as long as all of us have been alive, and it still hasn't been, uh, it, it constantly is an issue. Trying to change driver behavior for texting and driving, similar. Uh, there's incredible public education efforts, and we know how difficult changing driver behavior is. And thus, when we are trying to change driver behavior to reduce wildlife vehicle collisions, we also uh, face that uphill battle. Uh, so often we use signs. Uh, there are many standard uh, signs placed on our highways uh, with very little effect. Uh, but what we do find are those signs that are placed during seasonally, uh, and so are only there at certain times of the years at least there's some effectiveness in reducing ABCs. Uh, and again, it's uh, less than 50% uh, on average. The other uh, way we try to warn drivers is have animal detection systems since animals either on or approaching the road. And th this technology then turns on flashing lights um, and it can be effective uh, from 33 to 97%. So uh, depending on how well it's maintained and um, where it's placed uh, has a lot and how much uh, of the length of the road it has to cover, the system uh, effectiveness is then also uh, increases uh, the smaller uh, section of road that's treated by the animal detection. Now they're trying to move animal detection on board into automobile systems uh, using LIDAR and, and infrared. Uh, the problem is there have been no publications on the effectiveness of these new systems uh, to reduce wildlife vehicle collisions. Almost all of the research has been on how effective the systems are in identifying uh, the, uh, the animals. These are usually larger bodied, warm, warm bodied animals. Uh, and of course, um, you know, the, the effectiveness of the driver to react also has to be part of the solution. And uh, so we really don't know uh, how it's reduced wildlife collisions at this point. But uh, even for those who have older vehicles, uh, there are post manufacturing systems for infrared uh, that you can put onto your vehicle uh, for, particularly for nighttime driving. Uh, another way to influence driver behavior is to increase visibility for the driver so they have more time to react to animals. Uh, and this has, uh, again, some effectiveness. Uh, it's around 50%, depending again on the species and the width of the clearing along the road, uh, but uh, it does have some effectiveness. And then another one that is quite effective is the, uh, those that increase visibility by uh, road, roadway lighting. Uh, so it does improve, uh, reduce collisions with large animals. However, the downside is it can attract small animals uh, 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 with nighttime lighting. And then another way to use reflective materials for domestic livestock, this has not been studied yet, 
but often we just deal with wildlife and we also know with animal vehicle collisions uh, that livestock are often hit. And uh, this is a, a, a notion that would be, uh, it's like $2 per ear tag for a reflective ear tag, but again, it hasn't been uh, studied. Another way to uh, protect wildlife uh, is to slow vehicles down, particularly what's called traffic calming, using speed bumps or rumble strips. And uh, they have the opportunity to reduce uh, collisions by up to 50%. So this summarizes, I didn't go through all the um, measures that didn't work. Those are uh, on, the, on the left column is the effectiveness to reduce collisions. On the right column is the effectiveness to reduce the barrier uh, of the road. And as you can see, uh, when it comes to driver behavior, there's only uh, uh, a couple that are highly effective. Uh, those are animal detection systems, driver warning, and then seasonal closures also are very effective if you don't have any traffic at all. Those are usually used in protected areas, uh, parks and refuges and locations like that. And as you can see, uh, almost all of those that reduce, uh, that rely on driver behavior don't improve wildlife movement or habitat connectivity across the road, except when you close the road uh, or you reduce traffic volume. Then the other strategy is to influence animal behavior around the road. Uh, and um, one of those, a very common uh, system is to put up uh, reflectors where the headlamps of the headlights of the vehicle hit the reflector and that shoots a beam into the uh, right of way and hopefully freezes the wildlife until the car passes at night. And while there's been a promotion uh, commercially by it, the actual effectiveness is, is quite low. Another one for very specific uses would be to use animal uh, repellents, uh, olfactory repellents, and they can reduce, uh, th this is one treatment that is possible. Uh, you do get less than a 50% reduction However, uh, it has to be used very, in very specific locales to be effective. Another one is wildlife culling and actually reducing population size. This tends to be deer populations in suburban areas where uh, they've uh, evaluated the effectiveness and it can be uh, quite high in reducing ABCs, uh, but it doesn't affect, uh, improve any kind of uh, uh, habitat connectivity. Uh, and another, uh, and both the expensive way to treat, reduce animal populations is through anti-fertility. It's very expensive, but it also can reduce populations and thus reduce animal vehicle collisions. And so again, when you look at all the different ways to influence animal behavior, many of them such as, uh, you know, de-icing alternatives, uh, treating vegetation, making it uh, unattractive to animals, expanding the median between lanes uh, are all unstudied. Uh, those that are studied, uh, only one, the wildlife culling was highly effective. Uh, some did get some reductions, as you can see that I mentioned earlier. So, but none of these effectively increase habitat connectivity. So again, uh, much is un, un, not understood on some of these mitigation measures. And uh, those that are, only one seems to uh, be highly effective. And so then the, the third option is just separating the animals from the road that relies on fencing. Uh, and of course, uh, if you fence all our roads, you're going to fragment the, our habitat even more. Uh, but you do get a very high reductions in animal vehicle collision, collisions. However, to, uh, you can sig significantly reduce the collisions with the fences, and that's why we provide the, the structures to uh, increase crossing of the roads uh, for not only target species, often when well-designed for many other species as well. And so this last one, again, is the, the why this is uh, the 
um, mitigation measure of choice, it's because uh, it's 80 to 100 uh, percent, average is well over 80 percent in reducing ABCs, and it does reduce the barrier effect. So again, crossings, and that is a big uh, component with the pilot project. Uh, in the new bill, uh, it's because it is the proven effective measure, and it not only treats large animals, but uh, many other species as well. So that's basically, having reviewed over the 20 different measures, you can see why um, this is the preferred uh, mitigation measure of choice. Uh, that. Uh, Many of these ones are effective, uh, may be dependent on the site or on the species, and we still need to evaluate some of the other measures. Uh, they're just poorly understood at this point, uh, even uh, 20, uh, 15 years on from the, the 07 national study. So uh, at least we've done a, a current review of the current status of what is known, what has been studied, what's been published, and um, that report is now available. And then just briefly to talk about cost benefits, which uh, again was also part of this pooled fund study was to update this uh, again, it was back in 09 when this paper was published uh, and particularly the direct cost of animal uh, we only used uh, hunting licenses at, at, at back 15 years ago, and thus uh, the cost of uh, the average uh, wildlife vehicle collision uh, was about 6,600 for deer, up to 30,000 for elk. But as you can see, uh, what we've been asked to do if in today's or in 2019 values, you can see the costs are even higher, over 8,000 for deer and over 38,000 uh, using that same methodology. But under the pooled fund study, the uh, two economists uh, from the University of Montana, John Duffield and Chris Nair, have been looking at the values of animals uh, for putting into these uh, mitigation measure cost benefits. And so they've looked at, they actually did um, household surveys in Minnesota as part of the pooled fund study. And they've come up with just tur uh, turtles at uh, 3,000. Uh, the passive use of uh, desert tortoises came up to about 8,000. Uh, and then when they uh, worked specifically in Minnesota on whitetail deer, it came up to over 13,000. Uh, so and then viewing value of elk out uh, in Yellowstone uh, was 17,000. And as you can see, there are wolves and of course, uh, passive use for grizzly bear uh, is quite high. So uh, as you can see, if we were to redo, uh, which they're in the process of doing, uh, the, the cost benefit analysis and the cost of collision with wildlife, and we put different values than hunting licenses in, uh, we can start seeing that uh, which, mitigate, which mitigation measures might be more cost effective than others. Uh, this again was from the old study that's being updated, but you can see if uh, when you take into consideration the costs of implementing the, the mitigation measures and the costs in the reduction, uh, some are, uh, quite expensive animal detection systems actually are over $31,000 per kilometer per year. So they actually are more expensive because they have to be replaced about every 10 years versus if you use fencing with underpasses and overpasses, uh, which only uh, fences are replaced every 25 years. The structures themselves were projected to last for 75 years. So uh, there is uh, going to be an update to this cost benefit um, study uh, through the pooled fund, and it'll be available uh, by uh, September. And so when you look at the changes uh, for the 22, the, the, the cost benefit analysis uh, that's currently being developed, you'll see that the value for wildlife will increase relative to that 09 study you'll see costs of collisions have actually increased uh, damage and injuries and fatalities, and that the costs of mitigations have increased, but at a lower rate. 
And what that ultimately means is that the balance, the threshold where the investment in the mitigation measure um, pays back for the costs of, of collisions, uh, which again, this is the 09, uh, where um, if you look at three, this is 3.2 deer vehicle collisions per kilometer per year, uh, you could then justify spending uh, paying for underpasses, jump outs and fencing. It's sort of the break even point. That's 5.1 uh, deer collisions per mile. Uh, we sort of came out with a, a balance of uh, the costs and then the benefits or what we call the threshold. These will all be adjusted again in the new study. Um, and so we, we predict uh, on this that it'll actually be lower due to the increase in the cost for animal collisions and the reduction in the relative cost of the mitigation measures. And so the summary from that, this particular, or what to look forward to is that uh, most cost benefits om omit many of the values uh, and that the 09 uh, cost benefit analysis is very conservative. It aired on the lower cost side. It will be uh, adjusted and, uh, and probably improved for in the, in, in the coming months. And uh, regardless of the, those caveats, uh, cost benefits um, are often a powerful rationale uh, that uh, just conservation alone, uh, some people would much rather uh, are much rather see the, the, the cost benefits in dollars rather than just conservation values protected. So I will stop there. Thank you. Great, thank you all so much for sharing your expertise on the issues of habitat fragmentation and wildlife vehicle collisions and your insights on the opportunities to provide ecological connectivity and uh, safe passage for fish and wildlife. Uh, well, I'd like to start out with um, a question around what exciting new developments or challenges do you see on the horizon with regards to road ecology, wildlife crossings, an aquatic organism passage with potential implications for the work and solutions discussed today. So maybe we'll start with Rob for that one, Patty the next one, and then if we have time for the third, we'll, we'll start off with Scott, but I'd love to hear um, each of your impressions on that, if you could share. Yes, I think going forward, there, there's gonna be a lot of reliance on the technology that are on cars, the, the smart cars or the autonomous vehicles and uh, that they will uh, reduce all the wildlife vehicle collisions and solve our problem. However, uh, that will address collisions with large animals. It won't, uh, uh, so uh, just to rely on that alone, uh, it doesn't solve two problems. That is smaller animals and it doesn't um, address the barrier effect. And so even though we might have smart cars in the, in the near future, uh, that will not solve all the problems with the traffic itself uh, and with uh, the needs of uh, species of conservation value that aren't large bodied. Yeah, really important consideration with our changing uh, technological future. Patty and Scott, any thoughts on this question? Uh, sure. Um, I guess uh, I think more site specifically, one of my concerns is that sometimes we're building these crossing structures, but we need to think about that long term management. And one of the problems, you know, we've been building ours and I've been working on this project a long time. And the, the problem is, is that humans want to use these crossing structures, too. And all the research, a lot of it, Tony Clevenger out of Banff. Um, has shown that the crossing structures are not as effective if we have humans trying to use them to link trails on either side. Um, and then there's really not good legal tools as far as being able to um, cite someone that's in the right of way. Um, and so, and the highway patrol is the only one in there. They really don't have good tools or time for that. And then the forest service, when it's national forest, we have to do area closures and that's NEPA and it's complicated. So my recommendation is just anybody doing 
a project and they're getting the NEPA done, make sure you add closures of the areas adjacent so you have effective crossing structures. Thank you for that, Patty. It's really helpful to have that project specific insight of some concrete examples. Scott, what are your thoughts? Well, I think there's going to be a challenge to try to accommodate climate change when we think about aquatic passability and that we need to understand, you know, what the new highs are that we need to account for in terms of sizing our structures and also, uh, you know, what are the low flow situations where you might be in droughts. Um, in order to accommodate the high flows, you, there's going to be a temptation just to make structures bigger. But if you don't build in a, a channel, if you don't have a low flow channel, it's going to create uh, those uh, depth problems for, for aquatic organisms. And the other thing is that when you do build a channel inside a structure, um, it has to be able to withstand the kind of flows that you expect. So it needs to be uh, able to shift and change, but it also needs to be stable so that it's not going to get washed out. And we need to keep in mind what the future flows are likely to be when we make those design decisions. Great. Those are really important considerations for adapting to a highly dynamic future. So I'm glad to have that expertise. Um, I'm seeing quite a few questions in the chat about design requirements or best practices, and also about maintenance of these structures once they're installed. Could you all elaborate upon the specific technical and financial considerations as well for both design and maintenance um, with regards to wildlife crossings and aquatic organism passage? Maybe starting with you, Patty, I know some of the questions were particularly geared towards the project you've been engaged with. Yeah, there were some questions in there, and I thought I could answer it quick. Is um, was there a minimum requirement for overcrossings as far as with on I ninety we used one hundred and fifty feet just because that's what they used in Banff and it worked. So um, I don't know of any minimums at this this time. Um, but the crossing structures are super effective. We're getting even though some of these crossing structures that are large were just open two years ago, we're already getting. Um, a thousand deer and elk in a year. And we did were basically these are the same same population we knew was genetically um, isolated. Um, so and then the question. So sorry, I am a space cadet. <laughs> the main question I just figured I was answering that. What was it? Um, oh, um, design requirements or best practices, and also um, both technical and financial considerations for maintenance once these structures are actually installed. Okay, yeah, uh, you know, I, that just needs to be disclosed in, in your planning document and recognize there will be that cost. All of I-90 is fenced to funnel animals, and because we're in a really high snow load area, there's a lot of damage to the fences, and um, so it is a cost, and it just needs to be anticipated that there will be some of those costs. Absolutely. Um, let me maybe Scott next and then Rob. Yeah, so I think in terms of the design, uh, the, the Forest Service manual that I referenced before is really the, the Bible for how to do it correctly. You can't always do it according to those uh, design approaches. And so sometimes compromises need to be made and, and those should be made by people that have experience because it can be hard to tell what, uh, you know, how the stream is going to react or how how stable the crossing is going to be. But in terms of maintenance, uh, you know, well-constructed crossing to, to meet aquatic organism passage is generally a more low maintenance structure over time than your traditional culverts and are also likely to last a lot longer. Yeah, and uh, you know, for terrestrial design, there was, again, uh, we're looking at a handbook that was developed in 2011 for wildlife crossings for terrestrial purposes. So a lot of new information has been gathered. Uh, I think uh, original designs have always considered wider uh, crossings are safer and you know the bigger, the wider, which are more expensive. And so we've never, you know, it's difficult to figure out uh, the, the exact, um, the, the perfect design that because of there's a paucity of information for the multiple uh, multitude of species that you're designing for. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, one can make fairly good um, estimates now that we have enough up and that are being uh, studied around North America. 
And then yeah. I think oh, um, I was just going to talk about the, the mitigate uh, the maintenance part. And the 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 issue is that uh, the states have to pay for the maintenance of the structures. And so uh, often the, the construction is usually on many of them 80% federal dollars, but then the maintenance falls onto the state departments of transportation. And that's uh, what maybe uh, might be a policy issue to address is uh, some kind of funding mechanism, not only for the building, but also the maintenance of the, of the structures. So, Thank Anna, you, yeah, Patty. I just wanted to add uh, that, you know, one of the other things is to think about uh, adaptive management because um, Scott's right. You know, we have been, we have these very flashy systems and we can design, we have these great hydrologists and engineers designing it, but you really, it's really difficult when you've gone from a four by four culvert to 180 foot bridge and you're trying to uh, redesign a stream that hasn't been there for 70 years and then the riparian habitat and all of it, it's, it's um, pretty complicated. And sometimes it doesn't work the way you planned. And so you need to be able to go in there and fix it when that happens. So it, it's really important that that's considered a cost just in the planning too. Absolutely. Uh, and and seeing some questions around cost and whether or not um, new innovations and materials are driving those costs down. Um, I know we only have one minute left, so if anybody wants to chime in real quick on that, and then we're going to pass things back to Aaron. Well, I'll just say something quickly about aquatic crossings, and that is we we were looking at the difference in meeting the crossing standards for Massachusetts versus replacement in kind, which is what often happens, and the cost is significantly greater. Uh, and and then we looked at what it would take to just pass a 10-year flood and compare that to meeting the crossing standards and that cost is not as big it's maybe uh 15 to 20 to up to 30 percent more and so really it's getting out of the mentality of putting in these undersized structures especially given what we expect with climate change that's going to do a lot of the good and then you know with a little extra effort you can make them fully passable and I would just say what I'm hearing from the pooled fund study uh, research team is that relative costs for the, the mitigation measures is, is going down relative to the cost of, of the collisions with the animals. Uh, and then there's new technologies being looked at, new materials, uh, fiber reinforced polymer bridges. I know Caltrans is looking at the possibility of building the first wildlife overpass not using a concrete or steel, but using what they call FRP uh, as, a, as a, a material for that structure. Great. Well, thank you all. This is really encouraging to hear all of these exciting new developments, and we really appreciate all the important work you've shared today. Erin, would you like to close us out? Yes, thank you, Anna, for moderating this discussion. Thank you to our panelists for sharing your expertise and your time with us today. Thank you to our audience members for all of your thoughtful questions. If we didn't get a chance to answer your question, I'm just going to drop my email in the chat box. Please feel free to send them to us and we'll try to get them answered afterwards. And as a reminder, for those of you interested in registering for our second webinar on the 11th on the fundamental role of good data in successful wildlife crossings projects, you'll be receiving an email later today with an invitation to register. So thank you again to all who have participated in this first webinar to help demystify wildlife crossing infrastructure projects. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, Erin. Great job. Thanks for putting this together, Anna and Erin. This is wonderful. We need everybody engaged. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you all. Thank you all. The email is now in the chat for those that need it.